Afghanistan. These are the images the world sees every day on the news. War, violence, poverty, and a society trapped in the past. But is this the full picture? I'm Nadia Golami in Kabul. We are here in Afghanistan to discover the role that the Internet plays in people's lives. Away from the headlines, a new Afghanistan is trying to emerge. A civil society full of surprises and eager to embrace the latest technologies. But can the Internet really help Afghanistan to become part of the information revolution and join the 21st century? Kabul, a city known for many things, but being an online capital connected to the information superhighway is not one of them. I've come back to Afghanistan to look at people who are living online lives and to examine the crucial role the Internet could play in developing this country. Masoud Hosseini is a Kabul-based professional photographer. Normally, actually, I'm coming to this part of Kabul, which is the old Kabul, and I just found my subjects no, uh, mostly about the daily life of Afghanistan in here because I can find whatever about the life, the normal life in Kabul here. I was born in the uh, old city of Kabul in 1981. I was a baby actually that we uh, had to go to Iran because of war and violence that started in Afghanistan. Most of the foreign journalists won't come here alone because they're afraid of all these people and all the, these messes. But anyway, because I am from this old city, I, I don't afraid and I don't scare anything and I always I come and never find problems so I start photography myself by reading books then try to buy a camera I just remember that I worked for my first camera for nine months whatever I could do to earn money I did to buy a camera the old city looks almost medieval but unknown to many, the whole of Kabul is covered by a massive wireless network. It's one of the few cities in the world to have such internet coverage, but it came about through necessity. Three decades of fighting have left Afghanistan's land-based communications network shattered. For a guy who is young and he's living here, does it make him happier to have internet and connect to the world? Sure, actually. If, I, if you ask about me and my friends, for sure, yes. Because sometimes even happen that the normal, I mean, media in Afghanistan do not work. Like, uh, I mean, we don't have power or something. Then if you have mobile and internet, so you can check whatever you want in internet with your mobile. Mm -hmm. And then you can go around the world with internet you can find whatever you want in internet but unlike masood who has a top job at an international news agency most kabulis simply can't afford to use the service the biggest users of the internet are not the afghan people it's the international community it's governments um, embassies major companies you have to consider that the internet in Afghanistan only started in 2002. There was no uh, international connectivity um, other than voice before that time. So it's relatively new compared to the rest of the world. So it's had less time to, to penetrate into, across the country. There needs to be certain infrastructural movements. There needs to be a better generation of power. Uh, there needs to be a cheaper movement of the internet around the country for it to become more ubiquitous, to become more available to the people. Excuse me. The world's media gather for a United Nations press conference in Kabul. It's breaking news and as always, Masood is in the thick of things. The reality is that if internet is 
cut in Afghanistan for one day, I'd never be able to work in my job. We will first hear some remarks from uh, the SRSG, uh, after which the SRSG will be happy to take a few questions. That's been a difficult process. It's been marred by so many problems, not least, as you know, widespread fraud. I cannot prejudge what will be their decisions a few days from now. It's no surprise that journalists are big internet users here. They have to stay in touch with the rest of the world. But how keen are ordinary Afghans to get online? In 2001, there was no telecommunication or internet in Afghanistan. But in this short time, 11 million people have taken mobile uh, phone services, which is quite unique. And what I can say is that the same eagerness is there even for internet services. But if Kabul is anything to go by, there is a serious gap between the government's aspiration and reality. Despite being the seat of power, the capital feels insecure. Roadblocks and armed men are everywhere, and the threat of Taliban violence is ever-present. The capital city doesn't even have 24-hour electricity. For Masood, this is all just part of his daily reality. His priority now is to file his photos. So, we just go inside. Is it dangerous for you? Here? Yeah. Not really. What do you want to do now? Just upload my uh, photos. Actually, our internet is really fast mm -hmm. because we pay, uh, I mean, uh, a lot of money for uh, the company. When I take a photo, then I have to send it to somebody who want to publish it or who want to buy it. Yeah, yeah it is in wire, yeah, yeah, thank you, yeah. When it's not internet, so I can, I, I'm not able to do that. So I just have to, I mean, just sit somewhere and, f I mean, forget about that. You're done? Yep. Successful? I did my job. Okay, good. As a hard news photographer in Afghanistan, the war is always on Masood's mind. That, that was a, I mean, a suicide attack. Uh, it, it was, I, I think, it was in Kandahar Road, and just I, because I just want to show the, I mean, death and the. Is it death? Yeah, and and because it was a lot of blood and the body was completely oh. kind of destroyed, so I just showed this as a death. And he has seen how the insurgents here have started to use the internet in their media campaign against the West. I'm sure you know that during the Taliban, they were against the uh, internet, they were against everything. But now they're using internet to say propaganda to the media, and they just sent email for those three internet. and just show the I mean, media that, OK, we are still alive and we are doing something against government. But what is it like outside of Kabul? I'm on my way to Herat in western Afghanistan. It's next to Iran and is generally much more stable than Kabul or the south. The city is well known for its classical skyline of minarets and the world-famous Palace of Herat. But nowadays, these historical landmarks find an echo in the communications towers. Jamshid Sultanzada, internet entrepreneur. His whole world was changed by computers back in the 90s when he started taking evening classes at this modest-looking skill training center during the Taliban rule. So this is an important place for you? Yes, sure. Actually, this is the first place in 
my life I've seen a computer and I have touched a computer. This institute. And can we yes. go in? Yes, yes, sure. We can go in. Hello, everyone. Hello. Is this an English class? Yes. yes. How are you? Fine. Thank you. Jamshid first started coming here under the Taliban, mainly because there was nothing else to do in the evenings. Television was banned, cafes, restaurants and cinemas were all closed down. On that night, I was really into this computer. That uh, I didn't know that the, the class is already empty. We are already two hours here. And uh, they, well, one day the, the manager came here and said, at that time the manager came and said, oh, still you are here, what are you doing here? You should have gone already to your home. In those days, there was no internet, but this was just the beginning of his lifelong obsession with computing. At that time, it was a computer like this, a very slow computer. And now I have a MacBook. I have a MacBook Pro, the latest version of MacBook. And not, not everyone ever in the world is able to use this. I changed, computers changed also. <laughs> and even I have a smaller computer. <laughs> This one? Yeah, a very small one, a Blackberry. Students at this center have to pay a small fee to attend. But what was striking was the conviction among pupils and staff that the two educational skills taught here were critical for a better life, learning English and learning computers. There is a good education level at the moment. There's a huge implementation of primary school education but there's no IT component of that. That IT component needs to be brought in and used uh, to teach people about the internet. I remember it was like 1997, 98, I heard that. By the year 2000, if someone does not know computer, how to work with a computer, he's like illiterate. It, it, it was just showing the importance of the computer. This class at Herat University's Faculty of Computer Science shows one possible future. Linux versus Windows. Open source Linux is a freeware and source code is available to manipulate. Seeing modern classrooms full of male and female students learning about computer operating systems made me hopeful for Afghanistan's future. Exactly after these two words are the words open source and closed source. Use the internet. Uh, as other countries are using now for information, for data, for everything, for sharing data, for everything we are using nowadays internet. But it's not usual for all the people in Afghanistan. It's more for pro professional people who need internet. Although the university is state funded, most of these students were from privileged middle class backgrounds. But even they complained that the price of the internet was beyond their reach. I don't have internet at home because uh, it's too, too expensive to have an efficient internet in the home. Every hour we should pay something like one dollar between these things. But it's also it's not usable, just maybe Google some takes nothing else. Payment of internet is uh, also high, so we cannot be able to, to pay some, lots of money to, uh, to have access to internet. If I want to have the internet in my home, unfortunately, I shouldn't pay around $100 per month. But uh, it is a high money for me, and because I'm a student, I don't have enough money to pay for that. And I, I myself really need the internet in my home, but um, unfortunately, I can't have. $100 per month just for dial-up internet access seems very expensive by Western standard. But in Afghanistan, with the average income currently around $850 a year, home internet access is effectively a luxury product. In a way, Afghan society is becoming even more divided. It's no longer just about material wealth and poverty, but about information poverty. Jamshid never went to university, 
Instead, his computer skills landed him his well-paid job in an Internet service provider. His company is trying to bring down the price of the Internet for Afghan consumers, and he blames government greed for the high prices here. The Ministry of Communication is the one who is issuing the licenses for ISPs. The first thing, if they want to help Internet grow into everyone's life in Afghanistan, first they have to just decrease the prices, they have to lower the prices of the licenses. Is it really trying to uh, help the uh, business grow or they're only thinking about their own money? The Afghan government say they are not making a profit from the Internet and that their long-term aim is to try and make access affordable for everyone. But they are having to build the country's land-based infrastructure from scratch and until this is finished, they admit costs will remain high. What happens is to give people internet services during uh, today or uh, in the past, uh, we have to depend on the satellite, using satellite. And uh, satellite bandwidth is very expens expensive. And due to that, uh, the internet services are generally expensive. We have to uh, invest in uh, ground-based infrastructure and this is uh, uh, systems like uh, optical fiber network mm, the optical fiber network will connect uh, most of our uh, uh, large cities in Afghanistan and at the same time it will connect Afghanistan with all the neighboring uh, countries but there are many in the Muslim world who have a problem with the very concept of the internet they see it as an American invention a tool of Western cultural imperialism full of immoral and an Islamic content. Indeed, during the Taliban era, the Internet was completely banned. And even now, many Afghans remain deeply suspicious of foreign influences. We visited the central mosque. By coincidence, that day's sermon was a vitriolic attack on the foreign media. The Imam said, today we can see how foreign culture is penetrating every house in Afghanistan. The West wants to corrupt our people and take us away from our God, our culture and our humanity. We were starting to attract unwanted attention and were advised to leave. But not all Islamic thinking is as conservative. The Sadiqiyya Madrasa is just around the corner. Here, computer use is not just tolerated. It's encouraged as the best tool for researching hard to obtain Islamic texts. The internet is like entering a garden where there is every kind of fruit. Some will taste bad and won't agree with us. And there are even thorns to hurt us. So it is up to us to work out which fruit to choose and which ones not to. The Internet is exactly the same. Why then were the Taliban so opposed to the Internet? They were against everything that brought us knowledge, including the Internet. They had their own agenda. They wanted to keep people ignorant so that you'd accept whatever they said. But today, there is a growing appetite to get online. I visited a net cafe in Herat. That's unique. The whole place is run by one extended family, all of whom live in the nearby compound. So everybody behind this computer here, are your family members? Yeah, most of them, they are our family members. Can you introduce them to me? He's my your cousin? Cousin, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this one is my nephew, nephew, Mr. Majid. Mr. Majid? Yeah. Also, they are our relatives. Also, she's my cousin as well. Your yeah. cousin? 
Miss Zahra. And, and also this is our uh, other cousins here. And uh, here we have... Uh, he's my father. And also he's the leader of this compound and the, the leader of this the family. family. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, the family. By sharing the cost of a high-speed broadband connection, it's affordable for everyone. And nearly 200 of Mehdi's friends and family benefit. Zahra spends more than 20 hours studying online every week. I'm in my fourth year of medical school and I come here to the Family Net Cafe to study in the evenings with my cousin and nephew. At 9 p.m. we lock the doors to the public, but I continue working on the web until well after 11 at night. Apart from saving money, another reason for the collective net cafe concept is that the internet in Afghanistan is completely unfiltered. Everything, including un-Islamic sites like pornography, is easily accessible online. Mehdi's family want to keep an eye on what their kids are looking at. Because the internet has bad sites which we don't want to our children or our family, or especially for the children, for the, uh, for the youth, teenagers, we do not want to use the ad, ad for some sites which is not good. So we have uh, um, some uh, supervision for their activities as well. Whenever they are using the site, uh, one of our families, they are uh, uh, visiting and they are seeing which sites they are using. Although there are some uh, disadvantages, but it doesn't mean that we should not use. For example, touching to the electricity will cause that, this. But it doesn't mean that we should not use from the electricity. Also, internet is the same. Everything has, like a queen, has two, two sides. One positive side and one negative side. And it, internet has lots of advantage if the people know how to use it and if the people have accessibility to that. That evening, I caught up with Jamshid again. He was meeting his friends in a hotel just outside the city. They often meet up here for a coffee and to use the free Wi-Fi. All of them were as technology crazy as he was. Fasha John Shiverin Shomanchi. Gushi Shoman. Mag Gushi Google Jack. Google one. Watching them showing off their latest gadgets almost made me forget I was in Afghanistan. But it occurred to me that their internet obsession was also a form of escapism from a difficult reality. So you told me that the internet is the, one of the biggest part of your life now. How many times during the day you check your email and how often you use it? Yeah. <laughs> Have you seen the heavy smokers? They just smoke, I mean, they start a cigarette with another cigarette. They just keep smoking uh, every, every minute, every like hour. Uh, for me, internet is like a cigarette. I got addicted to the internet and uh, I just, the first thing I do in the morning after I just open my eyes is running to my mobile phone, my Blackberry, which is just next to me, and then I check my emails first. So I have to check every hour, every half an hour. So I'm addicted to the internet. <laughs> it was time to leave her out. My next destination was Bamiyan in the central highlands. Bamiyan in the central highlands. This beautiful district is usually associated with the destruction of the famous Buddha statues by the Taliban back in 2001. Most of the locals are ethnic Hazara, descendants of the Mongols and Shia Muslims. They have long been the underclass in this country. What is less well known is that proportionally to the size of its population, Bamiyan is a thriving hub of Afghanistan's nascent blogging community. A blogger feels more free in his weblog, in his or her weblog, 
than any other media uh, tools or environments like uh, newspaper and radios and TVs. Uh, Weblog is, is, is a place you can discuss anything you want, anything, without any format. And uh, the people I'm focusing more is uh, just uh, education, uh, poverty, very, uh, very strong poverty is exist in Bamiyan. My hosts here were Mehdi Mehrain and his wife Batul. Both are bloggers and both use the Internet for the work as human rights monitors. But the Internet played an important role in their personal lives too. When they were courting, they were studying in different countries and it helped them keep their relationship alive. Now they are married with a newborn baby. Her internet bill ended up costing more than her university bill. <laughs> it is not accepted for unmarried people to talk to each other in Afghanistan. You were not engaged, so how did you do that? Well, it certainly was a break with tradition. We couldn't tell anyone about our relationship really, but Batul's family are very open-minded. She was teased and warned gently occasionally to be careful. But after all, who could be better than me? Batul works at a human rights organization where she uses the internet to compose and file reports on the situation in Bamiyan province. But she also writes a blog aimed at introducing the reality of life here to a wider world. When I'm in the bazaar, I notice the children most, and the women. They're rarely seen in public, and if they are seen, they're wearing the full worker. The difficulties facing people living here aren't talked about much in the media. I have friends in Australia, South Korea, Iran and the US, and they read my blog as soon as I publish it. Beautiful though, Bamiyan is. This province is also very poor. Mehdi took me to visit the caves carved into the cliffs on one side of the Bamiyan Valley. Once Buddhist monks lived here. And now the caves are full again. This time, the residents are penniless internal refugees from Afghanistan's seemingly endless war. Halima has seven children, but her husband, the family's main breadwinner, was killed by the Taliban. She's typical of those Mehdi and Batul are trying to help. But what does the internet mean to her? Internet. I am illiterate. It is worse than being blind. You can take an illiterate person and shove them in a cave and they can't say anything about it. I have heard of people working with computers, but I am illiterate and I don't know anything. We have not received any help from the government. Although Halima only lives a couple of miles away from Mehdi and Batul's house, hers is another world. For many years the Hazara were forbidden from education. But now these people have made self-improvement through learning a priority. In Bamiyan, educated Hazara like Mehdi see the internet as a tool for empowering their whole community. There are many people who doesn't have access to the internet and even many big population that they never know what is internet and they, have, they haven't seen even the computer. Electricity is another major problem of the uh, uh, majority of the people of Bamiyan, but uh, you know we, we, we can now solve all the problems in one night. It is going on step by step. We are hopeful to, to, to see one day that those children have access to electricity, internet and also real life.
We drove back to Bamiyan town, past the ruins of the old bazaar. The Taliban had destroyed much of this area as a deliberate attack on the culture of the Hazara. But times have changed. <laughs> Mehdi took me to his local net cafe to meet Mohammad Nazari, one of the original Hazara bloggers of Bamiyan. So what does he want for the area? What I want, not just for Bamiyan, but for all the Hazara, is to improve in all areas, especially the Internet, and for it to become a tool to help us to become part of the world. And tomorrow, for Bamiyan, it's to take its place in the world and make all sorts of improvements. Afghanistan is not only landlocked, but seems somehow psychologically isolated from the rest of the world the legacy of 30 years of fighting. But I kept hearing how the Internet could help this country rejoin the community of nations. We, maybe as a small group of the bloggers of Bamiyan, we found Internet as a window to the world. And maybe it, it, it requires to, to, to feel as a responsibility to introduce Bamiyan to the world through Internet. And also bringing something from the world to Bamiyan people, so we can act as a bridge between Bamiyan people and the world. The tranquility of Bamiyan can make one forget one of the biggest issues confronting Afghanistan today, the war. These New Zealand soldiers are part of the provisional reconstruction team in Bamiyan. They are securing an airstrip so that the visiting American general and his entourage can take off in safety. The American would be a high-value target if any insurgents found out about his visit. Like most of the foreign soldiers here, these troops have access to the Internet. It makes the deployment more bearable, but also creates new problems. They have to be careful not to compromise operational security or OPSEC with what they say or do online. It's, it's just important that when they're sending information home, whether it's um, written or, or photos or anything like that, that they just worry about um, OPSEC and make sure that there's nothing contained in the photos or in the um, written text that could give away information that we don't want given away. What about introducing the country, for example, beautiful uh, Bamiyan, introducing the Bamiyan, do you take pictures well, of Bamiyan? Yeah, when people go on patrols, they like to take photos of the scenery and them with um, some of the monuments around the place, um, and then they just get checked when they come back and people are allowed to put some stuff on the internet so their families can see what they're up to and stuff like that. My next stop was Bagram Air Base outside of Kabul. Back in the 1980s, this was the hub of Soviet military power during their occupation. Now it is the hub of American military power. The base is the size of a small city. Around 20,000 troops live here. Specialist Shannon Chapman comes from Indiana. She is in the National Guard and is involved in the huge logistical operation supporting the frontline combat troops. Before being deployed to Afghanistan, she'd never left the United States. Well, I'm 23 years old. Joined the Army when I was 18, right out of high school. So I've been in the Army for five years now. It's my first deployment here in Afghanistan. And I've uh, been here for two months now. It's going pretty smoothly so far. Shannon showed me the glorified shipping container she now calls home. So this is your room's door. Yeah, this is so my this room. This is your little room. Yeah, little my little room. room. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, let's try to make it girly and add a little personality it is, to it. Yeah, it is actually. Is this Afghan scarf? Yeah, I got that from the bazaar here. Mm -hmm. To add a little color to my walls, and then I got another one to uh, 
cover up part of my wardrobe over there. I have a photo album that my best friend Kelsey made for me. Mm. Yeah, she wrote me a nice little letter, and then inside a bunch of pictures of me and her. So it should be really helpful here. Alex. Yeah, it's Far it's good to home. look. And home is also just a mouse click away. The whole of background base is covered by Wi-Fi. This gives American troops access to the rest of the planet. How do you use the internet? For what reasons? Um, I get on the air for Facebook a lot to mm -hmm. see pictures of people back home. Uh -huh. and I use Skype to call and to video chat with people back home. And then iTunes, of course, to get music for my iPod or um, shopping. I've bought some stuff online. I bought this right here, so I'd have really? some. Really? Yeah. He, did you buy it here for I bought in it Afghanistan? I bought it online through Victoria's uh -huh. Secret, yeah. And they send it to you? They send APL. <laughs> yeah. That's great. I didn't know that. Bad can, for my bank you account. You can shop <laughs> online in Afghanistan. Yeah, I know. Just so I have something to wear besides uh, army. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Make me feel like a girl. The top brass recognize the usefulness of allowing military personnel access to the internet. Staying connected to their families at home is extremely important to their morale. They could be working seven days a week, 15 to 18 hours a day, and that 30 minute call they might have with their child on a birthday or, or a major holiday is a significant morale booster for them and it allows them to focus more on the mission at hand. Everybody's always on the internet. It's really one of the few things we have to do around here in our free time. That makes it a lot easier to be able to call back home and be updated on life back in the States. I'll just call somebody's cell phone. Okay. What time is it now in the... Uh, let me get my iPod here. Indianapolis. It's almost two in the morning there. <laughs> <laughs> it's ringing. Yeah. What are you doing? Well, we're not too much out. It's just laying down. Oh, did I wake you up? Yeah, but it's okay. Oh, okay. It's about 10.30 in the morning here. What are you laughing <laughs> Nothing. Yeah, sometimes it's a little hard, you know, seeing people's stats on Facebook, you know, talking about going out on the weekends or this party or this or that. And, I mean, of course it's good talking to them, but it doesn't change the fact that you're in two whole separate countries. Well, I miss you and love you. Uh, I miss you and I love you too. Okay, good night. All right, all right, well, I guess good day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks. Support troops like Shannon are unlikely ever to leave the confines of their bases throughout their deployment. Although they have to carry loaded guns at all times, it's considered too risky for non-combat troops to wander about outside the wire. Well, baskets, they me. <laughs> to compensate, the US military have built a little slice of Afghanistan inside Bagram Air Base. Shannon took me to an artificial oh, Afghan-style bazaar where the troops can shop for souvenirs in safety. Here in your base you have the latest technology between the army people, but mm -hmm. if you come to the bazaar, most of people don't have that latest technology. Right. How do you feel that? Uh, how do you compare? The, do you think that these are two different walls between you and these people here? Oh yeah, I think it's, it seems to me to be really different. I mean back home and even here on the internet, I mean, it's like you have so many things you can look at, you know, gain information from right at your fingertips, you know, just searching through and then here, they mean, they only know what they see every day. Oh, I see. You know, they don't have the opportunity to pull out the computer and log on and Facebook mm -hmm. people. From cave dwellers to transcontinental online shopping for sportswear from machine guns to iPhones. Afghanistan is certainly a land of contrasts. But can a society that is so deeply rooted in its own historic culture, values and mores reconcile itself to the world of modern technologies and indeed to the outside world in general?
Back in Kabul, I went to meet people behind an innovative project that aims to do just that. The Turquoise Mountain Foundation runs an educational institute which aims to create a new generation of highly skilled Afghan artisans ready to do business in the 21st century. We try to combine the traditions with contemporary um, technology, contemporary knowledge, in order to give them the best possible opportunity to, uh, to improve their work and to have exposure to the wider world. The Foundation's master craftsmen teach calligraphy, jewellery making, woodwork, textiles and ceramics. It also employs local workers to restore antiquated buildings in rundown neighbourhoods. But relearning near-forgotten traditional skills is only part of the students' duties. Getting to grips with modern business skills, including information technology, computers, is also key. So an important part of this is using the internet. This both allows our students to have access to sources of information, sources of design, which relate to Afghanistan, but perhaps are very inaccessible here. So a good example of that would be something like a museum collection, perhaps the Met Museum in New York or the v &A in London. Through the internet, our students can look at these kinds of artworks, they can understand more about their own heritage, and therefore become creative artists themselves, rather than just copying what their masters are teaching them. To complement this, the Turquoise Mountain Foundation is building a large computer database of Islamic art and design, which will become an online library for Internet users in the future. We're building a large database of 12,000 images of traditional design techniques from um, across the Islamic world. And we've been able to take pictures of these designs and bring them to the students to show them what sort of quality we need to get back to in Afghanistan. So if I was a craftsman, I wanted some inspiration for my work. I might go to this resource, type in Jali screen, and up would come perhaps 100 images of different Jali screens from across the Islamic world. And there I could see different designs, different techniques, different processes that had been used to create Jali screens from 200 years ago until now. Ideas like that, which bridge traditional Afghan culture and modernity, are really inspiring. But recent history has not been kind to this country. Afghanistan's countryside is littered with places like this. So-called tank graveyards, where discarded weaponry slowly rusts away. The internet is a powerful force, but can it really help to heal the scars left by 30 years of brutal war and political extremism? It's very true that Afghanistan has many, many major challenges to face. And a lot of people will imagine that the internet uh, doesn't even begin to address them. And in some ways they are, of course, correct. But the one great thing that the internet does do is educate. One of the biggest factors for growing up, for improving, is internet. Because internet connects Afghan people to other world. It's a big world. We should use, we should be in this world to meet other people, to make improve our country. Development is not only reconstruction or construction works. Many things should develop. Uh, we have to be uh, more in communication with others. We have to know the world. The world should know us. Most of the foreign technology in Afghanistan has been designed for killing, but the internet is one invention that this country can't afford to ignore. If you're communicating with people, there's much less likelihood for conflict, for war. For, uh, you, you settle arguments by talking rather than by fighting not only within Afghanistan, but with their neighbours and with the rest of the world. If you're online, then you're talking to people. Afghanistan needs to seize this chance to join the internet era. Failure to do so could leave this country stuck in the darkness, from which it has only recently begun to emerge.